now let's talk about projectile motion where we're using vectors to represent our initial velocity and our position. Any object that's projected out into space must have some initial velocity. We can represent that using a vector like v0. And in this case, this vector will have two components, the horizontal and the vertical component. The horizontal component is the magnitude or the initial force times cosine of the angle that the object is thrown. And then the vertical component is the magnitude v0 times sine of that angle. We also know that once an object is released, the only force acting on it is gravity. Now there is such thing as air resistance, but we're going to assume that we're in a very simple case without any resistance. That means gravity is the only object, uh, the only force acting on our object, and we know gravity points straight down. So we're going to represent that force acting on our object as negative g, which is a placeholder for whichever version of gravity you want, either feet per second squared or meters per second squared. And it's only happening in the j hat direction. It's a vertical force. It doesn't move things horizontally. We know that force can be represented as mass times acceleration. And since we know that the object is only being acted on by gravity, we know that the force acting on the object must be negative mass, m, times gravity, g, times j hat. Now the force acting on the object must be equal to mass times some acceleration, even if we didn't know what the acceleration was. And we also know that acceleration is the same thing as the second derivative of position. And if our goal is to find the r of t vector that represents position, maybe we prefer that notation instead of a for acceleration. Notice also that we have an m on both sides of our equation, which means we can divide that off, leaving us with the final version of this force relationship that says negative g j hat is equal to the second derivative of r of t. If we want to solve that equation for r of t, all we need to do is integrate both sides of the equation with respect to t. So integrating on the left, we're integrating negative g in the j hat direction. Integrating on the right, we're integrating r double prime. So on the left, we gain a factor of t. We also gain this constant vector c. Since we're integrating vectors, we have to assume that there could have been a constant in any direction. And then integrating the second derivative of r, that just reverses that one of those derivatives. Now we're at the first derivative of r. If our initial velocity vector can be represented using v0, then we can use this as like an initial value problem. Plug t equals 0 into our function, this equation that we have here. We would get a 0 plus c is equal to r with 0 plugged into it, which is v0. So we can see that c has to be that initial velocity vector. If our goal is to get that position vector, we need to integrate one more time. So integrating both sides of our equation, we're going to gain an extra factor of t. So now we have t squared over 2 times negative g in the j hat direction. Our initial velocity vector v0, when we integrate that with respect to t, that gets a constant t multiplied, not a constant t, it gets a factor of t multiplied to it. Notice we are going to get another constant vector. I'm going to call this one c2 because we've already used c as a constant vector before. So this one is also a constant vector, but it's the second one. And then on the right hand side, when we integrate r prime, that knocks it down to r, the original position function, no derivative. We're going to use the vector r0 to represent our initial position 
and the same way that we solved for c, we can solve for c2, and we can see that that's actually, man, a couple typos here, sorry guys, c2 is the initial position vector. Now, we need to write this r of t vector in component form, and to do that, first we notice that we have one component right here, j hat, but v0 has a j hat in it, and so does c2, which we just said was r0. So if we rewrite r of t using all of the components, we can sort them and put all of the i hat components in one set of parentheses and all of the j hat component in another set of parentheses. So for the i hat, we have x0, which comes from our initial position vector. We have t times v0 magnitude cosine alpha. That comes from the initial velocity vector. And then in the j hat component, we have our initial position y0 plus our initial velocity magnitude v0 sine alpha times t. And then we have that last piece, which is only happening in the j hat component that is from gravity. This r of t vector function we just found helps us to demonstrate the path that an object is moving after it's been projected. So if we know the initial velocity and we know the initial position, we could then recreate or create the path that the object is moving as it's being projected. That r vector, the position vector, has the two components, the horizontal component, which is given by the i hat piece, and the vertical component, which is given by the j hat piece. So j hat represents this distance, and i hat represents this distance. For any object that's projected out into space, we can use this general form the, for the vector r that represents the path of that object. There's a few other things that we can generalize. For example, maximum height. If the j component represents the vertical distance that an object is traveling, then we can use concepts from Calc 1 to help figure out where the maximum height will occur. Before max height, that vertical distance is increasing. After max height, the vertical distance begins to increase. So we're basically finding a critical point just from the j hat component. So if we take the j hat, find the first derivative with respect to t, set it equal to zero, we'll find t max. Taking that first derivative, y0 is a constant, so that would be 0. The derivative of the second term it would just be the coefficient of t. And then the derivative of the third term is going to be 2 times 1 half times negative gt, which would just be negative gt. So that's the derivative of the j component. If we set that equal to zero, we can solve for t. And we're gonna call this not just t, but t max. t max is where we reach maximum height. If we plug this t value back into the j component, not the j derivative, but the actual j component, we can find the maximum value for the height that this object is going to travel on. And that's represented down here at y max. So we find t max, plug it back into the j component, and that will give us the maximum height. Another thing that we know is that when the y component drops back down to zero, the flight is over. So maybe we started on the ground, that's fine, but then the height increased, so the y component was no longer zero. And then as the object starts to 
fall down towards the ground, eventually it will hit the ground and have a y component of zero. So setting that equal to zero, that will tell us the total flight time. Total flight time is represented by two magnitude of the initial velocity vector sine alpha divided by gravity. There's one last thing we know now that we have this R of T function, and that's the range. The range is the max horizontal distance that an object travels after it's been projected. To find that range, all we need to do is take that total flight time that we found when we set the y component equal to zero, and then plug that into the x component of our vector. That will tell us the maximum distance in the horizontal direction that our object will travel. Now that we have all of this information, we can answer some applied problems. For example, if we know that a volleyball is hit when it's four feet above the ground and 12 feet from a six foot high net, it leaves a point of impact with initial velocity of 45 feet per second at an angle of 28 degrees and slips by the opposing team untouched. First thing that we would wanna do is represent our vector function with all of the components that we are given. We're given a few things. We're given enough information to represent the initial velocity vector and the initial position vector, so r0 and v0. We know that the ball is hit when it's four feet above the ground and 12 feet from a six foot high net. Now you have a couple of options here. If you picture your volleyball net, you can say that you are 12 feet away from it by calling your position the origin or you could say that you're negative 12 feet back from the volleyball net entirely up to you you can represent it either way i'm going to go ahead and use the negative 12. so i'm going to set the bottom of the volleyball net pole as my origin which means the ball is 12 feet back negative 12 and then it's four feet above the ground because well, when you hit it, you're not laying on the ground, you're standing up. So we've got four feet up and negative 12 feet back. So our initial position will look like four, sorry, negative 12 in the horizontal direction and four in the vertical direction. Our initial velocity, we're told that it has a magnitude of 45 feet per second and an angle of 28 degrees, so that would look like cosine 28, sine 28. With those two pieces of information, we can build the entire function r of t. In the i hat component, we need negative 12 for our initial position, plus t times the x component from the initial velocity vector, which would be 45 cosine 28. And that's it for the i hat component. Then for the j hat component, we'll have four from the initial position vector plus t times the component from the initial velocity vector. And then lastly, minus one half g t squared. So that is our initial position, uh, not sorry, that's our entire position function. And that's going to represent this volleyball that we're throwing or projecting over the net. One of the questions is how high does the volleyball go? Well, on the last slide, I told you how to find max height. The next question is how long is it in the air and what is the range? So this is our flight time and then taking that flight time and plugging it into the X component. 
And then there's a couple of questions that I want to leave for you to think about. If the volleyball is seven feet above the ground, how far is it from where it will land? So if you think about the projectile motion, if we know it's seven feet above the ground, it's either here or here. I want to know how far it is from where it lands. It lands down here on the ground. So we need to calculate this distance and this distance. And then last, what would have happened if the net were eight feet high? Meaning, is the ball going to go over the net or is it going to hit the net? Now I've made the position function for you. I've shown you the formulas for how to calculate each of these parts to the question. I'll leave this as an exercise for you to try.